It is refreshing in any case. How to continue. New affirmation here. New affirmation. That's repeated together. Many say they believe in Jesus, but few follow him. Stop. And the trick here is they don't know the difference. Isn't that interesting? Think about it. It'll come to you later. Okay. It is one thing to talk about helping the poor, but it is another to share what we have with them. Stop. Think about them. They had churches that actually have budgets of millions, and they probably don't do as much as you do as a church about helping people outside the church. Isn't that interesting, David? Okay, the next one. It is one thing to think about generosity, but another to give up what we've had here. That's one of my favorites. Okay, we say, you know, we're generous. Uh, I gave up a bunch of clothes yesterday. And I still have enough to wear. Isn't that good? Amen. Do I have an amen? Okay. But isn't it interesting that we tend to overvalue what we have? You know, I can't get rid of that pair of shoes, Brenda, because I may need it five years from now. And, and it's, it's sort of a little bit of a sickness. Okay, I'll stop commenting right now for a little bit. It is one to say, it is one thing to say we are willing to become new people but another to leave our old life behind. Isn't that true? See, I'm gone to commenting again. But check, isn't that true? Okay, next one. It is great to live in a nation full of great intentions, but it is another to live what we claim. I'm not going to say a word. Okay, next one. If Jesus came back tomorrow, do you think he would be received? than he was 2,000 years ago. Amen. Good morning. No, but you got dinosaurs on your knees. He does. <laughs> I see that. <laughs> see what I got this time. Oh, do you know what these are? No. I think we get one out. It's a band aid. You use band aids, don't you? Yeah. When you cut yourself a little cut or something like that, right? That's what we use band aids for, right? When we got a little, little cut. But you know what? A lot of people look at God and Jesus as a band aid. They forget about God and Jesus all the time until they get in trouble or something goes wrong. And they call out to Jesus. Well, they call out to God. And they want a band aid to make it feel better all, all the way up quick. But you know what? God's not a band aid. God's there with us all the time. On Sunday morning, on Monday morning, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday morning, even Saturday evening when you go to bed, God's there with you. He's not a band aid, He's there with you all the time. And all you got to do is talk to him and he will be overjoyed. Right? Because you like talking to people, don't you? Well, God likes talking to you and listening to you. So but not only say your prayers, but talk to him every now and then. And that would be a good thing because God's not a band-aid. God's with us all the time. Right? Prayer, please. Almighty God, King of the universe, bless these children, this child this family, this church family, which you love and arms around us and keep safe. Which pocket? You sure? Okay. You're welcome. One advantage I have that you don't, I get to see Cody's face while he's up there. And, and he is locked in to Jake as he uh, speaks. And you can, you can just tell, you know, uh, this is a wonderful, wonderful opportunity we have to witness to each other. Okay, let's go to God in prayer. <coughs> Our Heavenly Father, we are the lucky ones. We got to come to church today. We didn't waste the time in sleep. We didn't waste the time traveling. We just got up, took baths, put 
put on clothes and came to church because we came, oh Father, with the expectation that somehow we're going to receive a blessing. And Father, we always do. The blessing may come in the form of a smile. The blessing may come in the form of insight. The blessing may come in the form of truth. The blessing may come in the form of community. Lord, we are your people. Bless us. And now remembering those who are struggling, those who have no church family, those who are confused, those who are ignorant, and those who are tired, oh Lord, we ask you to remember them in a special way. This we pray in the sweet name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to talk about John, and it's the beginning, following the lectionary. And Tom's the one who got me. If you don't like the sermons, don't blame me. Talk to Tom about it because he's the one that got me on the lectionary, and I follow it just about every Sunday. One of the good things about the lectionary, Butch, is it forces you, it gives you some options, but it's almost the same theme. Can I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. What is the lectionary? Okay, that's what I'm trying to do. This is something, Sharon, that the church devised a long time ago that you would break the test, the, the Bible up in such a way that you're not going to preach every Sunday on the revelation of John or Daniel. This forces you to get out and preach, and if you do it a four-year cycle, you pretty much cover the Bible. Isn't that nice? That's great. Okay, see, and there's good reason to it. Now, the other advantage of a lectionary is this. There's a lot of stuff I've I'd look at it and I'd say, I really don't want to talk about that. But Tom, the lectionary doesn't give me an option, and, and it makes me just dig. And today is a prime example. I, I didn't think I wanted to preach on this. And the more I got into it, Steve, the more I understood it, the more I said to myself, this is exactly what we need to talk about. Okay, so now comes something that I've said, and I'm going to say it by itself so you remember it. And you may disagree with me, and I'm, I'm good with that. But Jesus said that the road is wide, but narrow is the gate, and few of those who enter therein. I don't think he was just talking to spend time. He was telling us that Christianity is not for everyone. Christianity requires thinking. Christianity requires involvement. Hey, Phyllis, see, I'm glad you're here. Now, Grum will have to behave, incidentally. No? Okay. <laughs> we can hope, Phyllis. But Christianity is not for, the, for people who just want something to rubber stamp. Christianity requires decision on your part. And, Frank, requires involvement. It's one thing to say we are patriotic. Do I have an amen? It's another thing to defend each other's right to speak. And so, John, in the beginning here is going to talk about this fellow by the name of Philip, Jay, and tell us who Philip was. Well, Philip became one of the twelve. Yes. And um, it's very interesting how he met Jesus and said, oh, he did not need signs, he did not need anything. He went to his friend, Nathaniel, and said, I found the sign. The one promised by Moses. And Nathaniel says, really? Okay. And that's what we're going to talk about. Okay. We're going to talk about this person that Philip brought to Jesus by the name of Nathaniel. And there's some real interesting, uh, real interesting scripture there that we're going to try to unpack today. And so uh, I should have said 
If you have your Bible open, go ahead and open it to uh, John 143. And I'm actually going to read, uh, go to get someone to read 47, 48, and 49. Uh, Phyllis, have you got your Bible open? Okay. Uh, Nathan or Susan, okay. Someone this side. Tom, okay. Tom, I'm going to get you after I finish 46. I want you to read John 147, 48, 49. Okay? Okay, 40. Three says Jesus decided to go to Galilee. That gives us a clue that he was somewhere else. Do I have an amen, Robin? And the Galilee is up north, uh, unless he was coming down. But in any case, he's decided to go to uh, Galilee. Now, this is in the beginning of his ministry. The disciples are coming together. He said he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, now this is sort of interesting because Nathanael is from Cana of Galilee, and Philip obviously knows him and says to him, uh, we have found him about whom Moses and the law and also the prophets rose. And then he says, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. So he says this, we have found the Messiah. And Nathaniel says to him, when did anything good come out of Nazareth? You got the point there? Uh, there a little bit of issue there. What's good that ever came from the Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see for yourself. And then he says this, Tom. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said to him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Okay, now let me unpack that last little thing, and then we'll go again. The last little thing, it, uh, it Nathaniel said to him, there's some, some chemistry here. There's something that happened there that suddenly Nathaniel goes from unbelief to belief. I think, I think Jesus was charismatic, charismatic, I think Jesus one of the, was one of those people that people could, my dad could walk into a room and change the room and never say a word. It was something about him. And he says about Jesus, he says, Rabbi, and that means one who teaches. And then the second expression that he uses there, Tom, is son of of God, one who has the attributes, one who is godlike. Let me translate it that way. That's the Greek, Andy. One who is godlike. So I'm translating teacher, one who is godlike. So he knew something about Jesus. And then he says, King of the Israel, Israel. King of Israel, the one who offers hope. For Israel. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. Amen. It's interesting how this story starts, as Jay said. Here, Philip comes and approaches Nathaniel, and I think there's an awareness here. That wasn't a big territory, Robin. If you look at the map there, you can see Cana's not that far. You have Capernaum uh, off in the distance. <coughs> it's likely, Steve, that all these people knew each other or had heard one another. When you and I were back in high school, we would play Gaffney, we would play Clinton, and we had other associations. And it wasn't uncommon for someone to say, oh, those Surrettes over there in Gaffney, you know, yeah, I know the Surrettes. 
We knew each other. And here in this story, Philip, Philip, who knows Jesus, goes to his friend, friend Nathaniel and says, you got to come meet Jesus. He is the Messiah. And the first thing that Nathaniel says to him is, because Nathaniel knows that Jesus came from Nazareth, and the first thing that Nathaniel says to Philip is this, well, whatever good ever came out of Nazareth? Now, personally, I think that Philip probably had some kind of experience, don't you think so, Nathan, with Nazareth? Nazareth was a very Jewish town. In the wisdom of God, he puts Jesus to be raised in a... Nathan, have you thought about that? The wisdom of God to put him in the worst place that he could put him to grow up with scandal because he doesn't want a wuss. He wants someone that knows what it's like to endure hardship, to endure scandal, to endure those church types that know everything. Don't y'all love that group of people? And this is exactly what's happened there. Philip says, come and come with me and, and meet the Messiah. And, and Nathaniel says, what good ever came out of Washington? We say that, don't we? See. What good ever came out of New York State? Huh? What good ever came out of the north of the United States? <laughs> da 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 da. And if you get this, you get precisely what the New Testament's trying, what John is trying to convey. That sometimes, out of places that we least expect, that's where the answer is going to be. All you Republicans, think about good. What good has ever come out of the Democratic Party? Actually, a lot of good people. <laughs> what good has ever come out of the Republican Party? Abraham Lincoln, among others. And the first thing that I think John is trying to understand is God does things in ways that we don't, Steve, and the answer that you've been looking for in this side of your yard may actually be on that side of the yard. Interesting, isn't it, Tom? And so, and so we come to the part which says, come and see. Now, this is an interesting story. Someone, Tom, being led to the Lord, and that's what it is. Someone being led, led to the Lord. And we've seen other examples of that in the Testaments. The woman at the well. I think Jesus sought her out. I don't think he had to go through... Uh, that he wanted to go through Samaria. I think he had to because he knew that woman would be there and he went at the time that he went because he wanted an encounter with this woman and they have a conversation. He has a conversation with Thomas, Frank. After the resurrection, Thomas says, I, listen, I didn't witness this. <laughs> it's, it's good if Robin wants to believe it, Susan wants to believe it, but Sharon and I weren't there, and I, 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 I just, I just, you know, it's a good story, but I'm just not sure I can buy it. And then there's this fellow by the name of Nicodemus who comes to Jesus in, in the night, and he has learned, he has studied. And he comes to Jesus and he says, tell me. And here is Nathaniel, and he has the same questions that Nicodemus, that Thomas, that the woman at the well are going to have. 
The same questions that uh, I had, the same questions that Robin has. And I love that because it tells us this, Christianity is not afraid of hard questions. You like that, Phyllis? Dandy, you can ask me anything you want. Now, I don't know if I can answer it, but I love the fact that we in a community church that's not afraid of difficult questions because Cody, in the years to come, is going to, hey, Cody. Hi. He's going to have many questions in the years to come. And our responsibility is to answer them as best we can. Now, the other thing about this little story case that I like is the fact that it seems like there are two questions that continuously are recovering. And the first question is this, is it true? And it's the question that we ourselves have had. Particularly when things get rough. Do I have an amen, Jack? Brenda, when things get tough, when things don't go our way, we have the question, well, is it really true? When we're in the hospital hurting, <laughs> when the doctors are trying to figure out what's wrong with you, when we are tired and sore, sore hurt, our question is always going to, is it true? Do I have to put up with this? But Christianity has a follow-up question which is, I think, just as good. And that question is this. Well, if it's true, show me. Nathaniel, come and see for yourself. Come and see. And I love the story of Mother Teresa. There she was. Uh, someone came, went there to Calcutta, get, got together. The person had a lot of wealth. And she was really moved by the work that Mother Teresa was doing. Uh, uh, sis, uh, Mother Teresa. And she was really moved by that. And, and, and she said to Mother Teresa, she pulled her checkbook out. And she said to Mother Teresa, she said, Tell me what I can do. And Mother Teresa's response to her ethel was this. Come and see. And took her to where a hungry child was and said, sit down and feed him. Come and see. And Butch, no matter what religion says, no matter what churches said, no matter what preachers say, I think it really lands on that second question. Is it true? And then the follow-up question, well, why don't you come and see, David, if Sandy Springs is as good as we've been talking about? Come and see, Vandy, if we are actually living the gospel. Come and see, Tom, if denomination makes any difference in here. Come and see, Susan, if we are helping these ministries. Come and see, Nathan, if we are learning anything. Come and see, David, if there's belief in this church. And I will tell you, the problem with Christianity today, today is not that first question, is it true? People want to believe the real problem with Christianity today is that that second question, come and see, prove it, show it to me, is not there. And Phyllis, I think of the churches with these uh, when I was in Charlotte out there at uh, that church, it's famous there, downtown Charlotte, Steve. I was talking about that. I tell you what, you could stand ten people like me, one on each other's head, and you wouldn't reach the ceiling. 
and that beautiful organ and that stonework and, and all that stuff, just absolutely beautiful. And all I could think about is, is I'm wondering, I'm wondering if they are helping the poor. I'm wondering, Andy, if they are bringing people to know Jesus Christ. I wonder if they could show us. And finally, finally, Nathaniel sees Jesus and he says, Rabbi, he says, Son of God, King of Israel, he wants to know how, how how do I know? How do I know that this is true? And Jesus is going to say something very interesting, which the Greek is, Greek is going to help us to understand. And Jesus said, I saw you under the tree. But actually, the translation of the Greek is not good there, Tom. And I love this about the Greek. The Greek gives us insight because the translation should not be, I saw you under the tree. The real translation should be this in Greek. When I saw you under the tree, I knew you. What's it telling us? Frank, is this, is that Jesus knew exactly who Philip was and Jesus wanted Philip to be a disciple. He handpicked him. He handpicked him because in, in Nathaniel there was this hunger for God that he had not found anywhere else. He chose Nathaniel because he knew who Nathaniel was. Isn't that a fascinating Phyllis? So I want you to do something. I want you to put, take your right hand. Now I'm confusing you. That would be this hand right here as you look at it. Okay, take your right hand and go to your left shoulder and tap, and tap yourself in the left shoulder. I want you to say this. You're one of the lucky ones. <laughs> I woke up this morning with a hunger for God. And I had to come here to Sandy Springs to see. You're one of the lucky ones, Steve. God put a hunger for God in you that you can't satisfy when you're out there fishing trout or whatever you do. Ethel, God put a hunger for you, and I know you like me and Herb. You hurt some mornings, and, and God and you got up, and, and Herb was attempting to just say, I'm going to stay home today. Not really, was it? Because you have this hunger for God. And when you have this hunger for God, nothing else will do but to seek Him. I have come to see Brenda for myself this morning, if it's true. So I'm going to close with a story about my. Dad, mom, my dad was uh, exceptional in many ways. He was, uh, I, I've told you the story, he was slated to go to med school and I think about a month before he was supposed to go, he decided he'd become a missionary for the money, of course. He'd been offered, he was the first graduate from Glendale to finish college 
he had offers from banks. He was, he was prime, what we call prime material. And he decided, I want to become a missionary. And off he went to Nashville to study. And he said it went really well for about two years. Things were really good. And he was studying. He was learning about theology. He was just, he was a good student. He, Nathan, he studied. He didn't expect grace to be given, Nathan. And one day, there at Vanderbilt, one day he walked into the library. And there at the table, was my mom. And he told me, he said, Son, I never studied again. I had found what I had always been looking for. This is what Nicodemus thought. This is what the woman at the well thought. This is what Thomas found. And this is why you're here today. This is what I have always been looking for. And we as a church said, Amen. Amen.